Hello and welcome to another episode of the Conservationist Assemble podcast, headquarters for the world's mightiest conservation heroes. Each week, the podcast hosts an animal advocate or environment enthusiast to discuss all things surrounding a particular species or habitat. I am your host, Johnny Bloxham, and we have an amazing episode in store for you all. Today's episode takes us all the way to Vietnam. Please welcome to the podcast as we discuss all things Asiatic black bear, Charlie Paul. Hello, Charlie. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us here today. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Great. And we are obviously here today to discuss all things Asiatic black bears. Obviously, in our back and forth, we have discussed that probably if we were to put money on it, we would agree that they are the least well represented species of bear and so we're here to try and get them a bit more awareness so first and foremost then can you please tell us a little bit about asiatic black bears yeah um so obviously as the name suggests they are one of the bear species that are found in asia um they have a huge uh, range they're found in 18 countries across asia um as far west as iran uh, kind of following the Himalayan foothills um, and as far to as far east as Japan. Um, and they're found as far north as Russia um, and then as far south as Southeast Asia in countries like Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand. Um, but sadly, despite obviously having a vast range, their population sizes are very small. Um, they're fragmented and they're kind of, kind of dotted around areas. Really, they're not kind of linked up across Asia, um, and that's where a lot of their vulnerability lies. Um, so they are classified as vulnerable by the IUCN. Their major threats are um, commercial hunting for bear parts and also um, for live bears to go into the bear bile industry. Um, but also they can be caught as bycatch by poachers. Um, obviously snares will catch anything that walks through them. Um, obviously, habitat loss is a big problem. As I mentioned, small population sizes do threaten the bears because there is a massive loss of genetic diversity um, and also persecution from bear human conflict. Um, and I, I live and work in Vietnam, um, and there are very few Asiatic black bears left in the wild here. Um, there's not been much research done, but a study in 2016 basically um, suggested that there are no more kind of population strongholds in the country anymore. Um, but yeah, so the Asiatic black bear um, is probably most famous for that kind of white V shape on their chest. Um, and that gives them their colloquial name of the moon bear. Um, there's um, different subspecies across Asia, but the subspecies that's found in Vietnam, um, the males tend to be between 120 to 140 kilograms. Females are a bit smaller at 80, 100 kilograms. Uh, they're opportunistic feeders, they'll eat mostly vegetation matter, but they'll also help themselves to honey, eggs, insects, seeds, carrion, and they will hunt um, live prey themselves as well, um, if the opportunity arises. And their diet is um, very seasonal, um, seasonally dependent. Um, again, each species is different, and obviously the climate across Asia varies greatly, um, but in Vietnam, um, the breeding season tends to be between May and August, and uh, the cubs are usually born January, February time, um, and the sows will give birth to between one and four cubs. Amazing. So, obviously, a lot of, of information there, and we are going to talk mainly about the bear file trade today, but you obviously have introduced a, a lot of other threats um, and the reason why we're going to be talking about the bear bile trade is because you are part of the Four Paws organisation and you are uh, working at, at the Nindin Sanctuary. So could you please tell us a little bit about the sanctuary itself and, and Four Paws as an organisation and how they began? Yep. Uh, so Four Paws is uh, a leading global animal welfare um, organisation uh, that basically aims to um, improve welfare um, for all animals that are in direct influence by humans. Um, so we work with domestic species, livestock and wild animals. Um, we have 13 wild animal sanctuaries um, across the world. Um, uh, one in Vietnam, which is where I work at Bear Sanctuary Ning Bing. Um, we started construction in 2016 uh, and we welcomed our first three bears, Nino, Taizang and Taivan in November, 2017. Um, and since then, 
the sanctuary has grown rapidly. Um, it's really been quite amazing in five years how, how much has been achieved. Uh, we now have three bear houses and we currently have 46 Asiatic black bears on site. Um, the majority rescued from um, the bear bile industry um, and then a handful um, which were confiscated as cubs from the illegal wildlife um, trade. Amazing. So, and and obviously, we're we're presuming that that is only going to keep happening for as and, and keep expanding and growing for as long as as the bear bile trade exists. Yeah. Um. I mean, hopefully, there is um light at the end of the tunnel now in Vietnam. Um. In two thousand and five, the government here really wanted to crack down and end the bear bile industry in the country. So back in two thousand and five, there were an estimated four thousand three hundred bears on bar farms across the country. Um, and the last count um, is now 250. Wow. So massive improvements. We really are kind of just waiting for those last few bears um, to be taken to sanctuaries. Um, and that's from a lot of work from, obviously, we're in a coalition with the ENV, which is the Education for Nature Vietnam, um, and also with World Animal Protection. Um, so these guys are the kind of guys who go out um, to the bear bell farms and will basically try and persuade the farmers to voluntarily hand over their bears to sanctuaries. And obviously, we're not the only NGO working out here. There is also um, the Animals Asia Foundation and Free the Bears as well, who both have sanctuaries in Vietnam. Um, so between us, hopefully, the goal is that by 2025, there will be no longer any bears in Vietnam on bell farms. That's awesome. And and what kind of then presumably obviously talking about how the great work of reducing the amount of bears in bear bar farms has occurred. Are there any kind of concerns for capacity? Obviously, you've mentioned there are multiple sites and multiple other NGOs, but I'm assuming that there are concerns that, you know, there isn't a capacity for all of these bears. Well, Actually, Animals Asia Foundation are currently constructing their second sanctuary in Vietnam, which will hold a great number of bears. I'm not sure exactly on the exact number, uh, which they're hoping for. Um, and we are currently building our extension to our sanctuary. We're going to be building another three bear houses, um, basically within our sanctuary um, on the grounds. Um, so we'll be greatly increasing our capacities to hold more bears as well. So we're hoping that between all three, um, all three of us, we can we can kind of take in those last few bears. Fantastic. And obviously we, you know, have, have already discussed that there is a dwindling population of wild Asiatic black bears. Are there any potential for any of your bears to, to be released into the wild? Obviously it would be a, a long process if that was the case, but is there any, you know, cons or potential for that to help boost those numbers again? Um, definitely not for the bears that have been in the bar farms. They, um, are their well for a start their health conditions um are too great they, they're not healthy candidates to go back to the wild and the majority of these bears are old bears um so they've spent maybe two decades in a in a bar cage so they're not um ever going to be candidates for release um there could be potential obviously for confiscated bear cubs depending on how long they were in human captivity before coming to a sanctuary. Um, we're not set up currently for a release program, um, but that is something that I think um, NGOs are looking at in the future. Um, so there are plans maybe for that in the future, but currently none of our guys would be candidates. <laughs> Amazing that that is just being talked about as certainly it, it needs to be. So we've talked about how the four cause big kind of goal is is to improve standards of welfare are there any government aid being provided to four paws to help with, with their higher standards of, of welfare not just in asiatic black bears but just across the whole organization uh we actually rely completely on donations um for our work um and we have obviously a huge uh global network of supporters which we're really grateful to have um and yeah, we kind of, we don't have financial aid from the governments, but we do um, work closely with government officials and authorities to try and kind of push forward um, kind of what we would like. So for example, we're helping the Vietnamese government um, end the bear ball um, kind of trade because being here as a sanctuary means that the Vietnamese authorities can enforce the prohibition laws um, and that there, there is somewhere that they can send confiscated bears or bears that have been voluntarily handed over to them 
and um, because obviously without us they wouldn't have a space for the bears but and without them we we need these guys on the ground kind of keeping an eye on the bear farms and trying to persuade the farmers to hand them over and that is incredible in itself, isn't it? Because there is, while financial backing is, is incredibly important, it is also equally as important to have that government aid. <laughs> Let me just get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your guest? Yeah, he's been outside. He won't come in. I, was like, I know he's going to come in halfway through this and start talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh well he was more than welcome on the podcast <laughs> so then we've talked about how many bears are coming into your sanctuary could you just walk us through what kind of steps are taken by the sanctuary and four paws when lobbying for asiatic black bears to be released by the bear bar farmers and, and into your care yeah so there's kind of there's two two ways that a bear can come to the sanctuary um so basically in 2005, the Vietnamese government obviously wanted to get a handle on the, the bar trade. They wanted to get some control over the bear farms. So they microchipped all the bears that were already in farms in 2005. And they said that these bears were legally kept bears. Um, so if we wanted to have those bears, that the owner would have to cooperate and voluntarily hand them over to us. Um, and that's where people like the ENV, WAP and the authorities um, the forestry department do a lot of good work trying to persuade the farmers to to hand the bears over to sanctuaries. Um, the alternate is that basically any bear without a microchip, um, aka any bear caught after 2005 is an illegal bear and can be confiscated immediately by the authorities. Um, so that's how uh, the, bear, the two pathways that the bear can come to the sanctuary. That's, I mean, and that, and that post-2005 method then sounds very kind of productive in, in terms of enforcing and, and you know, getting that, that ball rolling then. Yeah, I think the, yeah, the, because it is, it has done so well and obviously there are so few bears now left on bar farms in the country, it kind of just shows that the method that the Vietnamese authorities went about into trying to bring this has been successful. Um, in all the countries in Asia, um, Vietnam is definitely um, leading the way in ending the, the trade. That is truly amazing to hear. And, and how can then everybody get involved with Four Paws's mission and, and vision, even if they aren't directly involved with, with working for Four Paws or, you know, us here in the UK? How can we help, for example? Um, yeah, well, we have um, obviously a website, which you can go and see all the different um, work that Four Paws uh, does. As I said, we are international. We work in many countries with many species, um, name a few, like the dog and cat meat trade, um, puppy farming, uh, looking after horses in Jordan. Um, we rescue uh, bears across um, Europe. We have big cat sanctuary in South Africa. Like we really are a massive organization. Um, so I think it'd be really interesting for people to go on the website and learn about our work and the different things that we do. Um, obviously people can always make a donation through the website. And we also have a lot of um, petitions on there that people can sign um, to help us try and push through um, kind of uh, policy changes. Um, so at the moment we have one out um, calling for an end to bear bar in um, Hanoi. So that would be really helpful if people wanted to sign that. <laughs> and Hanoi is, is the Vietnamese capital. Mm -hmm. So certainly by getting the, the you know the capital under belt, we'd assume that, that it, maybe the rest of the country would be quick to follow. Actually, um, it's more, I think, the idea that basically the majority of bar farms are, are in Hanoi. So the majority of the bears, the remaining bears are in, in right. Hanoi property. Um, okay. So that's kind of, if we could end it there, then we really are literally at the finish line. Oh, amazing. Well, I'll certainly be dropping a link to the, uh, the <laughs> petition and the website uh, associated with, with this episode. And we've, we've touched on public donations and what kind of work and resources do public donations help fund? Is there kind of a value that you could tie just to kind of encourage people to, to un understand where their, their donations are going? Um, I don't have exact values um, and everything is in Vietnamese dong here, so I couldn't tell you in <laughs> British pounds what that would be anyway. Sure. Um, but obviously we are expanding our sanctuary at a rapid rate. Um, obviously in five years we've built, we've gone from nothing to three bear houses which can hold 46 bears um, and we're hoping that by 
the end of this year, we'll have another three bear houses. Um, but obviously, building and construction costs a lot of work. As you can imagine, um, our bears are constantly breaking everything. So we have a very uh, good maintenance team that everything the bears destroy, they have to rebuild. That all costs money. Um, feeding bears, as um, again, anyone who's ever worked with a bear knows they are never full. So we've got big food bills. And sadly, um, we have large medical bills. Um, the majority of our bears are former bar bears. They have long-term health conditions ranging from um, heart disease, hypertension, um, osteoarthrosis, um, and obviously all the pain management medication that comes with those as well. So our, our medical bill is very, very high. Um, and obviously we have to pay all the staff that look after the bears as well. And we have a really strong team of bear caretakers, um, which kind of work tirelessly night and day in 50 degree heat, uh, work late, come early. So a really great team supporting the bears. Um, so yeah, that's where all your money goes basically is to make sure that these guys get the best of everything because they really do deserve it. After you see where they've come from and what they've gone through, like these guys deserve everything. Yeah, it sounds absolutely crucial. And and obviously coming from a, a an ex situ conservation organisation myself, um, yeah, it, it is crucial to to have public donations and and funding as as obviously as much as we don't like to admit it, money does make the world go round. Um, yeah, and yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, hopefully a lot of the people listening to this podcast can agree that that it is money well spent. So. I think you've given us a great insight into Asiatic black bears and four paws as an organization and, and, and threats surrounding them. So we are going to move on now to, to talk about you for a little bit and, and kind of how you got to where you are in your career, because there are a lot of animal advocates out there. It is an industry that, that is very sought after in terms of, of people trying to come through and, and get a foot in the door. And uh, we'd like to try and just pay it forward and, and obviously create a community to to inspire these people that they're not alone and and after a bit of hard work it can happen so yeah how did you get to where you are and and kind of what is your background um I've had a I think a very kind of convoluted path I feel to getting here um I am I've always obviously from I'm sure everybody in our industry says exactly the same thing from a very young age I knew I was going to work with animals um I think my parents thought this would fizzle out as I got older, but it didn't. <laughs> um, uh, I, I studied zoology at the University of Sheffield. Um, whilst I was at uni, um, I realised I needed to maybe <laughs> start getting some work experience. Um, I, I, before that, I'd always been had paid employment as a horse riding instructor, but I thought that that wasn't going to be my long term career, so I should go and try and find out what it was going to be exactly. And so I did my first internship for just three months over the summer holidays at Chester Zoo um, when I was 21, between my, my the end of my bachelor's and my master's year. Um, and I think after that three months, I kind of was like, hmm, I think zookeeping might be what I want to do. Um, and that was with on the giraffe team, and I really enjoyed that. Um, after uni, I then obviously had that six-month panic that nobody was employing me. I was sending CVs out and cover letters like, to everybody um and fortunately I got my first paid position as a seasonal animal ranger at Yorkshire Wildlife Park um and then from there I kind of just seemed to just moved all over the country um doing different positions different jobs um I always I, I was convinced I was going to be a hoofstock keeper but then um I was offered a position I was actually offered just a zookeeper position at Drusilla's Park and I kind of went in not knowing what species they were going to give me and on the day on my first day they're like you're going to work with penguins I was like oh okay <laughs> I, didn't, not, I didn't think penguins I've been working with giraffe and rhino all this time um completely fell in love with the penguins they're an amazing species like I finally understood why everybody's so obsessed with penguins <laughs> um and then from there I went on to specialize in primates for five years um at Howlett's Wild Animal Park and Monkey World and then I kind of just had always had this kind of desire to go and work abroad in situ. Um, and it was a big gamble because I was really enjoying my position um, at Monkey World at the time. And I really loved the work that I was doing, rescuing um, uh, the monkeys. Um, we had, I was on a small monkey team, so rescuing the marmosets from the um, pet trade in Britain. 
Um, but I had to roll the dice and I was like, no, come on, it's now or never. Um, and I applied for this job and uh, luckily got it. And yeah, now I work with bears in Vietnam. <laughs> Incredible. But that is that is this industry in a nutshell, isn't it? You know, you don't always know what you want to work with. And, and there is something to be said about not specialising too soon. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like you've you've landed on your feet and, and you're yeah a part of a, a really big cog um in in a bigger machine yeah i think i think it's yeah really i'm really glad that i didn't stick to one kind of taxa i'm glad that i've, I've had the variety um, and i've worked in like zoos i've worked in rescue centers they're very very different um kind of management styles in terms of the animals because obviously a lot of the time in rescue centers you're rescuing animals that don't behave as as a normal animal should <laughs> um they've usually got much more um considerable health conditions and um, you're kind of getting new animals in all the time and trying to add them into groups of misfits really whereas um, a lot of the time when we see in zoos hopefully you've got a nice stable family group <laughs> so yes absolutely very very different and then obviously in, in the zoos you get the opportunity to kind of do more of the captive breeding programs and that's very different um, so yeah lots of variety um, lots of experience so not necessarily then having been a, a bear centric person what is one fact or kind of little snippet about Asiatic black bears that when you first read it or experienced it it kind of was like oh you know wow these are an incredible species um it's not really a fact it's just something that I like kind of learned in my first couple of months here at the sanctuary like obviously before I came out here I read as much as I could about um, the bears and the industry and I tried to prepare myself kind of mentally and emotionally for what it was going to be like um and their resilience has shocked me. Um, when you really learn what kind of lives they've led for 20 years, what horrendous bowel extraction processes they've endured, and then on top of that, the now consequential health conditions that have come with that life, um, there's not many species that could survive in those conditions for that long. Um, and then when, on my, on my first rescue, when, we got we, the first rescue was uh, two or three weeks after I first started. We got nine bears in, which was the biggest ever rescue four paws had ever done. Um, the condition these bears came in really kind of shocked me. I thought, oh God, like these animals aren't going to survive, let alone thrive. And they completely blew me away. These guys are survivors. They bounce back. Like you wouldn't think when, when they come in that you, you can't even imagine them going out into big outside enclosures and climbing trees and um, digging their own dens and you know socializing with the bears and these guys, yeah I think the main thing about Asiatic black bears is they're just incredibly resilient animals and they just yeah they're survivors that's just truly inspiring to hear um, and yeah thank you for sharing um, so what obviously like to say it wasn't necessarily a career plan and, and you prepared yourself mentally and emotionally but what was your first experience with an Asiatic black bear? <laughs> it was um, rather underwhelming to be honest. Um, I actually <laughs> arrived out here in Vietnam in January and although the bears don't hibernate in Vietnam and um, they do slow down, become less active, decrease appetite um, so obviously I was itching to meet them. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to meet the bears, I'm going to meet the bears. Um, and we went into the, one of the bear houses and most of them didn't even, open, like, didn't even look up fast asleep in straw nests or in their hammocks. Like kind of we were calling their names, like, are you going to wake up for me? And they were like, no. <laughs> and it was just so different. Like I was like, I have worked so hard to come out and <laughs> to meet you guys and you're not even looking at me. And I've obviously, I'd come straight from being a primate keeper for five years. And obviously primates is so high energy. Um, you go into a primate house and it's everyone's bouncing everywhere. There's noise, there's people um, bickering and just so much energy and so much activity going on. And then to go from that to just sleeping bears and they slept for another two months or so. <laughs> and I was thinking, God, these guys are really, like, don't do much. But then the warmer weather came in and they, I got to see their cheeky side and they became more active again. Fantastic. So yeah, a little bit underwhelming. <laughs> So kind of off the back of, of them having a cheeky side, do you have any fun, light-hearted stories from your time around Asiatic Black Bears, considering 
that you know they are nicknamed you know the saddest bear in the world and and that's obviously a human emotion that we're putting onto them but yeah what fun light-hearted side do they have um yeah i mean obviously our old guys are they do like the easy easy slow life um but as i said we do take on cubs from the um illegal wildlife trade um i had to hand rear two cubs that came in last may uh two sisters um m came in at 2.4 kilograms and bay was a little bit bigger at 3.2 kilograms and yeah they were so much fun obviously I would much rather they had never been poached from the wild and that they were in the wild with mum and that they would never have come across a human. That wasn't to be for them, um, but it was still a privilege kind of hand-rearing them. Um, they were just little cannonballs with claws, basically. <laughs> they, you don't understand how dense a bear is until you held a baby one and it's like a little bowling ball. I'm like, they're so heavy and they're just so boisterous and they really just, yeah, just they were so much fun. They just destroyed everything. Um, they just climbed everything and it was just it was even cuter because Bay was really well developed compared to her sister I think M must have been the little runt of the litter um, her head was too big for her body still so her head was really head heavy so everything she would like try and climb she just then go like topple off head first so I spent like two months trying to catch this baby bear and if she wasn't toppling off herself then her sister was just honestly was just out to get her just pushing her off everything um, and it's kind of still the same now. Um, they're about a year and a half now. Um, and they're in one of the, the bear houses with the, an adult outside enclosure, not the little um, cub nursery anymore. Um, but they've not really changed. Em's still quite quiet and always lets Bay lead. Um, and Bay is still the absolute hurricane that she was when she came in at three months old. Like So, yeah, although they started out um, with a sad story, obviously being poached, like they were just so much fun, and I'll never forget the experience. Would you say then that obviously because it's hard in this industry to not get attached to the animals, and and we don't not want to get attached to them, but would you say that Bay and M for you are the the two that you've got the the most particular attachment with? Um, I think not. Uh... <laughs> I won't tell them. <laughs> I do love them. <laughs> I love them all. It's really hard to choose a favourite. Um, the vets always say when I take them round, um, like it's an in-joke, because every, like, every bear is Charlie's favourite. So I was like, you've got to be good with this one, because this one's my favourite. And they're like, Charlie, every bear's your favourite. Like, I know. <laughs> but my favourite bear, actually, um, was T. Uh, she, she came in um, in the, the Nine Bear Rescue last February, and I've never seen anything like it she was one of the worst bears um in terms of condition that we've ever rescued um she came in at 175 kilograms morbidly obese this bear should have been 100 kilograms so she's nearly double the weight she was missing her front left paw so she's now disabled and morbidly obese just from looking at her we you, you could see she had partial alopecia she had sarcopenia um, her first health check revealed she had bacterial cholecystitis, cholecystitis, moderate liver disease, osteoarthrosis in the lumbar spine, dental disease, you name it. There's everything wrong with this poor bear. Um, she was, she did have a 2005 microchip, but we suspect she was much older than that as well. She was a very old lady. And she, when, when the bears come in, obviously they're stressed. Uh, they've had a terrible life anyway, but they're stressed from the journey. So a lot of them are stereotyping. Um, they're showing aggressive behaviours towards us. Um, and then they will settle down with time when they learn their routine and they realise that actually they get a lot of honey here. So it's, it's not a bad place to be after all. But T didn't show any kind of signs like that. T, she was just lethargic and inactive and she just wouldn't move in front of us. Um she wouldn't even eat in front of us. We'd put food in, she wouldn't touch it. And then we'd come back later and it was gone. Um, so we moved her to a separate quarantine. We have like a big quarantine building. We were quarantining all nine bears in there, but we thought with all the activity, we, we moved her to a separate place um, and we made it just so me and the animal manager would work with her rather than lots of new faces. And slowly but surely over the year, um, she came out of her shell and we moved her to a bear house and we managed to, we started off, her rehabilitation took such a long time, but like we started off in a small paddock and then built up to a larger paddock. 
Um, we had managed to integrate her with four other female bears, which we never thought we'd be able to do. The weight just kind of started to just come off her. Um, she lost a lot of weight. She must have been feeling much better. Um, she would only eat pumpkin at the beginning for some reason, pumpkin and chicken. And then it took me months and months of just every like feeding her chicken and then slipping in a piece of apple. And at first she just spit it out <laughs> or a piece of banana. But one day she swallowed it and she was like, oh, I quite like that. I was like, yes, it's nice. You More of that, please. Pumpkin and, pumpkin. <laughs> um, and she was just, honestly, she was just the sweetest bear I've ever known. She was just so good natured considering everything. And she had this kind of, once she'd come out of her shell, she really had quite the personality. And like we, she has like a, her own kind of method to kind of dealing with new challenges. Like a lot of bears are obviously frightened or flighty or aggressive or confident when we give them new challenges, T would basically just kind of, you know, we'd put a new bear in, in with her and she just put her nose to the ground and just bumble in head first, like completely like inoffensively. And a lot of the other bears quite liked her actually, because I think they did find her very inoffensive. Um, or we'd let her out into a new enclosure and she wouldn't kind of be frightened. She'd just put her nose down, just bumble off and we'd be like, oh, I hope she finds her way back. And she always did. Um, yeah, she was a really special bear and sadly like, um, um, multiple health conditions all caught up with her in the end so she's not with us anymore but I literally think about her every day like she really puts your problems in perspective you know like if you if she can cope with all that and go from being a shut down bear that wouldn't even look at us to one of the most popular bears um, in the sanctuary in such a short amount of time it was just amazing so T does beat M and Bay just <laughs> And that, I get that. And it is obviously incredibly fulfilling knowing that, that you know, for at least part of her life, I'm sure you you are, you know, so overwhelmed that, that she did have that shell that she she come out of. And obviously it's a testament to the dedication of, of, you know, animal keepers and, and sanctuary workers around the world. And um, that, that of, of course, the animals come first and foremost all the time. Yeah, I think a lot of people, are quite a common question we always ask is, so how long does it take to rehabilitate a bear? And the answer is, it's for the rest of their lives. Like, we, it is never finished. You can't undo 20 years, um, ever. Um, even the guys that are uh, young bears um, who met, who um, were confiscated illegally, they might have only had a year or so in, in a cage, but the damage is done and the rehabilitation process is never over. And they just keep challenging us and we just keep trying to manage them as best we can and cater for all their individual needs and quirks. So not then that there's, a, you know, a such thing as a typical day in in this, this kind of sector, but what does, for lack of a better word, a typical day look like for you? Um, like you said, every animal keeper knows every day is different. Um, on a routine day, I'm usually working in one of the bear houses. Um, I like to work alongside the keepers as much as possible and obviously work with the bears as much as possible um, because that's how you get to know them the best and that's how you can pick up on any problems quicker. Um, but if we have new rescues in, then I'll work the quarantine building and obviously I only work quarantine um, until the bears are cleared. Um, if we've got cubs, then I'm hand rearing most of the time. And again, I wouldn't go to one of the bear houses if I'm working cubs. Um, doing um, any integrations, obviously, as I said, we're always rescuing new bears and trying to get them into into groups or um, pairs if we can, and if they if they would like. Some bears don't, so they have um, they can leave a, lead a solitary life if that's what they would prefer. Um, we have usually um, one health check a week at least with the vets um, so often I'm taking on vet nursing duties and I'm in, in, involved in in the health check um, and then I spend a lot of time um, we've got a keeper development program here so I'm either lecturing or running seminars um, with uh, my bear caretaker team um, just to try and like increase their knowledge about the bears and animal welfare and husbandry because um, these guys obviously um, or just kind of local local people that were hired five years ago um, to do this job. We are really in the middle of nowhere. Um, so they're absolutely amazing, really dedicated, and it's just really great to try and develop them and kind of turn this into a career for them. It's not just a job, and we've got so many passionate people, and they're so ambitious. It's really nice to see. 
No, it does sound great. That, that obviously there is that ambition for for people out there to have that as a career because I'm obviously not speaking from experience, but it's it's easy to assume that that maybe because human standards aren't always the highest or definitely aren't the highest out there that that you know pursuing a career to increase the standards of animal welfare is not certainly something that that's pushed out there. No, definitely not. And you know, um we are really in the middle of nowhere. We're just in kind of farming land. So everybody is just a farmer, really. Um, and that was fantastic, really, for us, because if you're a farmer and you've got practical skills, um, that's already half the battle. These Our bear, take, bear, bear caretakers can build anything, grow anything. Um, yeah, really physically strong, really physically fit. So that's half the battle already. And then it was just basically teaching them about bears and and yeah, basically specialising from kind of goat, goat, cows and goats to, to bears instead. Um, and I think at first, what maybe started out as just a job, as for many of them is now kind of like, they're, they're here for life and this is their career and they wouldn't ever do anything differently. Amazing. That is, is great for them. And, and yeah, it's um, great for you guys as well. What a resource to have. So then were there any influences on you and and you in your career path any people or any actions that that have kind of helped influence you um i think my dad was probably my well, was my initial influence um he is a huge animal lover so he like indulged me so obviously i was asking for every pet possible so i had dogs cats guinea pigs rats hamsters rabbits and he was the guy who kind of taught me like what responsibility was and what how you look after an animal and that's I'm sure that's how many of us started off you know looking after our hamsters and rabbits at home when we're five and six years old um, and then we build up to giraffe and bears and monkeys when we're <laughs> adults um, and yeah he kind of yeah just endorsed my passion and yeah took me to the local riding stables every Saturday without fail for nine years mucking out horses and riding um, and that's a very expensive hobby to have. So I'm really grateful he um, let me do that. Um, I think he would, must have, would have much preferred if I just stuck with gymnastics because you only have to buy a leotard for that and not a horse. But, <laughs> um, and then the second person that kind of, kind of got me to where I am today um, was Penny from Chester Zoo. Um, she run, we used to run the internship program and yeah, she kind of gave me that first opportunity to kind of get my foot in the door. Um, and to be honest, since since then, we've remained friends over the last decade. Um, she's such a like good friend and mentor and she's a, like such, such an inspiration. Like she will, there is nothing too, too much, like too difficult that she won't do for an animal. Her door is always open and it's not just for animals, it's for people as well, I'm sure. Again, hopefully anyone listening here um, who've been through the the internships at Chester Zoo will probably know Penny and know that she really does support her interns and does does her best to get them into paid employment afterwards um, and kind of point them in the direction because she knows how difficult it is in this industry to get that that first um, step in the door. Yeah, that is amazing. And I think most zookeepers do because it's a small industry, isn't it? Everyone knows everyone in, in the UK zoo scene. Um, most people are, I know someone that's been through the, the Chester internship program and my I mean I myself applied for a Chester internship um, so I have been in contact with Penny not as much as, as I liked I wasn't successful in getting it and in fact I was lucky to get an interview because I sent my application in after the interview had dated or the application date had closed so she was very nice just to give me an interview so uh, yeah I can, <laughs> I can see why you are up on the Penny and it's great that, that you know you that you still have that connection with her today. And on the flip side of that, then obviously moving out to a, a, a different area of the world, I, I can assume what your answer might be to this, but have there been any hurdles in your career? Yeah, um, again, um, I think a lot of people in the UK zoo industry will kind of emphasize with me, maybe not, but I think it's, um, I found it quite difficult, particularly in my 20s, kind of how slow progression can be and walk and feel in our industry. Um, have a lot of friends in other professions and they were getting promotions and they were managers and they were getting bonuses and they were 
you know, and I was just like, how are they climbing up the career ladder so quickly? And I'm just don't, don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. And then you realize actually it's the same for most of us. I think that obviously a few lucky people get that break quite early on in their career. Um, but, you know, I did put in 10, 10 years before I kind of started to get into the more senior positions. Um, so, yeah, I'm a very ambitious and competitive person. So that got me down quite a, quite a bit. Um, I'm happy to admit that, you know, sometimes it did, it did feel like you were constantly being told no. And there's always somebody more experienced than you. Um, but, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm really happy I, I stuck with it. Um, I know a lot of people can be forced out of the industry because they need to have some career progression or, or get better wages. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy I stuck with it because I'm here where I am today now because of it. No, I'm sure that will certainly resonate with a lot of, of the, the, the community. So uh, yeah, don't feel like you're alone and, and certainly probably plenty of other people are feeling the same way. So it might be nice for them just to hear that. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is looking to pursue a career in conservation but specifically with with those that are, are maybe looking to move overseas um my advice would be do as much research as you can if you're going to move abroad um again like i thought i prepared myself mentally um i kind of thought well you know i i love being out in the countryside um and and I don't see my friends that often because I live quite far from home in the UK, but it, it is very different being out in the rural countryside of Vietnam to the rural countryside of the UK. Um, there really isn't a Tesco just down the road. My nearest supermarket is a two-hour round trip, and that's very basic stuff. If I want really good food, I've got to do, do a six-hour round trip to Hanoi. So it, it's a lot of work just to fill the cupboards. <laughs> um, and... But I don't want to put, I don't want to put people off. I think just do your research, pick what you think you can mentally handle. Like don't set yourself up to fail. You know, um, I spoke a lot to my current um, animal manager before I came out here. She answered all my questions. She prepared me as much as possible before I moved out here, um, so that I did know what I was going to get into. So I wasn't didn't wasn't too um, shocked. Um, but I would definitely recommend people do it because. Like, I think, yeah, I think it does, it does build you up as a person. It gives you kind of a whole different perspective and experience of life. I've, I've developed skills out here that I don't think I would ever have developed in a UK collection um, because we face very different problems out here to what you have um, in the UK. Like, for instance, the language barrier. I'm, I'm probably the best communicator ever here now. I have a translator, but so much stuff gets lost in translation out here. Um, so yeah, we have very different kind of challenges and I definitely um, have yeah, learned a lot and I'll never forget it. And I just think I would encourage everybody to experience it. Even if you're just, even if you just want to do six months to a year, that's fine. And then head home. Um, some people might come out here and find that they want to, that's it. They've, they want to stay out somewhere forever, but definitely worth, to, worth doing. Fantastic. And yeah, it's great that, you know, you, there is, something for everyone in in doing this kind of thing yeah definitely um and you can't beat working with like the bears so <laughs> you don't really get to work with 46 asiatic black bears anywhere else but in asia so <laughs> yeah definitely um so great yeah thank you for for sharing all of that that knowledge um i hope that, that the listeners will find something in all of that to uh to kind of resonate and, and, and attach on and just kind of give them a bit of, of insight as to, to where they can go. And um, so we're just going to, you know, the last bit before we finish up our conversation today, just have a, a little bit of fun and make it a bit more lighthearted because it is obviously, a, you know, a, a, a sad topic at times, conservation <laughs> in general. So, yeah, we just want to leave everyone on a bit of a, a happy note. And um, so this is more of just a personality fit. Um, one to five dream species that you'd love to see in the wild? Um, obviously, Asiatic black bears. Um, probably not in Vietnam, maybe <laughs> somewhere else. Um, my favourite all-time species are killer whales, so I would love to see them in the wild. Um, Gelardas. Uh, I definitely want to see the cat bar langurs while I'm here because there are only 60 to 70 left, so I think it's see them now or see them never um and uh giraffe incredible i mean it's hard just to limit it to five but you did very well and yeah all very 
very cool species. So I hope you get to see all five of those uh, at some point. Um, one country, I mean, you might already be doing it, but one country or continent that you'd love to call home. Um, I'm going to say the UK <laughs> because I've not been home for nearly a year now, so I'm feeling pretty homesick. So, yeah, I think at the moment I'm definitely ready for some for a UK summer. It's far too hot out here, so I'm sure you guys aren't <laughs> doing it, but I'm definitely looking forward to cooler temperatures and some more rain. <laughs> fair. fair enough. Um, if there was one species, obviously we, we are as a collective aware of, of what the effects of humans can do on, on native biodiversity but if there was one species from around the world that you could have native to Vietnam as that's where you are at the moment without any negative effects on the ecosystem what would you love that to be? Um, I would definitely choose um, Siamang because I think the be they there would be nothing better than waking up to them singing in your garden every morning. <laughs> yeah you wouldn't get bored of that sound definitely. No. <laughs> Um, if you could be an animal, what would it be and why? Um, I would be my cat because he has the best life. Um, he's spoilt and, yeah, has it really easy living with me. So I think I would trade places with him. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, you could come and just get your two pence in on a podcast, which is yeah, absolutely exactly. more than welcome. He's next door now because he's like, it's dinner time <laughs> and you're oh. late. I'm like... <laughs> oh, I apologise. Uh, <laughs> and so obviously you talked about, you know, having to do a two hour round trip or a six hour round trip if you want really good food. Is there any particular food that represents the region that you, you enjoy? Um, in Vietnam? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really like the food. <laughs> I'm much happier with chips and gravy from the chippy. Right. We have no chippies. <laughs> right, so you'll have to fill up on that fix as and when you do make it back to the UK for a summer. <laughs> yeah. Great. So that uh oh actually one last one. When you're not working at the sanctuary on your days off, what do you do to stay busy? Um I walk my dogs. Um easier said than done. Uh obviously we're dodging electrical storms at the minute and really high temperatures, so I'm usually up at dawn or dusk. Uh, taking them out uh, around work um, and if not then during the day um, I'll head to Tam Kok which is about an hour away it's a tourist hotspot and they've got a great kind of traveling travelers bar there with a swimming pool and a great cocktail menu so that's where I'll be on my days off. <laughs> Sounds like a great way to unwind. Thank you to Charlie for appearing on the podcast be sure to follow the work of Bear Sanctuary Nin Bin and Four Paws on Instagram. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of the Conservationist Assemble podcast. Please follow us on Instagram at Conservationist Assemble Pod. I'd also appreciate if you could subscribe and give a five star rating wherever you get your podcasts and share the podcast with family, friends, and colleagues. This will help get the word out and support the Conservationist Assemble community. There is a lot more great conservation based content yet to come. Most importantly, thank you for listening and be sure to listen out for our next episode coming soon.